Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Let's Get Real about mental health. We've got a great program for you this morning. My name is Greg DeRocher, and I'm President and CEO of the Cambridge Chamber of Commerce, and we're pleased that you have decided to take some time out of your day to join us this morning. Throughout this week, the CMHA is urging everyone to get real about helping and by promoting empathy and just being there for each other when times are hard. This is something that fits in well with the Chamber's vision, which is to inspire change and lead in fostering greatness in our community and economic prosperity to make Cambridge the most envied city to live, work, play, and of course, build a business. I would like to thank uh, and uh, congratulate our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be able to put programs on like this. Bell, of course, everyone knows Bell. If you've uh, been stuck at home and online, as we all have, uh, Bell has provided a service that's been pretty vital to all of us. And Lone Wolf Technologies, Lone Wolf Technologies is a local tech company that services and creates and develops software programs for the real estate industry and does a fantastic job of not only that, but supporting Cambridge Chamber programs as well. I want to get right to it and introduce our speakers for today. I'm going to introduce both speakers. Um, and then one of them will take you through the first part of the presentation and the other through the second part. First of all, I want to introduce to you Lynn Charlton. Lynn is an inspiring and influential speaker with a passion for human rights, healthy and vibrant work environments, emotional intelligence, and systemic disruption. Lynn has a reputation for disrupting old thought patterns with new and inspiring ideas based in real human stories and experiences that audiences connect to. From regional councillors in chambers, executives at boardroom tables and grassroots volunteers, and of course, community members, Lynn is grateful to have influenced positive cultural shifts within communities, businesses, organizations, teams, and of course, individuals. Moving audience towards empathy, emotional intelligence, and inspiration to use our powers for good. Lynn combats subjectivity and negativity with positivity and data. Leaving audiences equipped and inspired to make real and sustainable change in their workplace, their leadership style, and within their local communities. Also this morning, we will have uh, Jim Moss, and Jim is the executive director of the YMCA Work Well program, a new initiative by the YMCA of Three Rivers focused on improving workplace well-being in the communities we serve and beyond. But first and foremost, Jim is a father of three and a proud husband. He has been inducted into four, get that four different halls of fame for sports and business and won multiple gold medals representing Canada internationally in three sports. Though he's all, he also likes to point out that he's lost many more than he has won. Jim is a top rated public speaker, was named as one of Canadian Business Magazine's Innovators of the Year in 2016. Jim holds a deep understanding and respect for behavioral sciences, data collection, and uh, applied research, and pairs that with a unique combination of communication skills, allowing him to connect easily with everyone from kindergarten students to CEOs. He has a particular talent for making otherwise complex subjects simple to understand and approachable. These talents support him on his professional mission to improve people's health and happiness wherever they work, learn, or play. Together, YMCA Work Well partners with purpose-driven organizations across Canada to help them collect employee feedback and action and those insights, as well as deliver training, coaching, and strategic consul consulting to create lasting positive change in the workplace. Because at YMCA Work Well, we believe that well being is everything. Folks, you're going to have a great session with these two incredible speakers. I'll now turn it over to Lynn and she'll take you through her presentation. Thank you very much. Good 
morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you again. It's been a long time since I've spoken with the chamber. So it is so nice to be moving sort of past those pandemic impacts and getting back into some of those regular things of life. So I'm here today to talk to you about mental health and wellness focused on leadership. Leadership often gets overlooked in the conversation of uh, mental health and wellness within our organizations. And so I'm so excited to be here with you today to uh, discuss you and what it looks like. So how has the pandemic magnified mental health challenges for leaders? This year has been the most stressful, or uh, 2020 was one of the most stressful years in history um, based on data and research. We completely overhauled how we work and how we meet. We stretched old norms and redefined expectations, both of leaders and of um, our employees. Empathy and innovative solutions to employee life challenges had to be implemented in ways we have never seen before. Decision turnaround pressure was absolutely there. I know myself as a leader within the human resources department um, of, of various local leaders here in the region definitely experienced employees hearing something on the news and running straight to my desk looking for guidance on how that was going to impact within their employment experience. And the pressure of having to turn around very large impactful um, organization impacting decisions in very short windows of time. Also, we had the fishbowl effect where every decision that we make is completely under scrutiny. Not only are we expected to make decisions with very quick turnaround time, we're also expected to make very good decisions in quick turnaround time, when a lot of us are used to a little bit of strategic planning before we hit go. Um, so that meant that some of our decisions landed, some of our decisions did not, but we were experiencing that within an environment where we were being judged and scrutinized in ways that maybe we didn't experience prior to the pandemic. We've been working through supply chain impacts and how that imp impacts in uh, more production focused employers and conflicts due to divisive world events. I know myself, in the, again, in the human resource department, finding myself drawn into employee on employee conflict um, due to discussion and debates uh, circulating global events, which are extremely with, out of our control, but seem to be happening on a more frequent basis as of late. There has been changes to employment and other regulatory compliance obligations. They've been very reactive to global events, causing a lot of us as employers to uh, feel like we're running to keep up to make sure that we're hitting those compliance measures. There has been the great resignation and layoffs. I don't think we talk enough about how stressful and challenging that is for leadership to lead through. Um, to be communicating bad news perhaps over and over and over again um, to a division or um, your, all of your, your staff that wears on you as a human being. Um, I don't ever want to minimize or negate those who are impacted um, by the great resignation or by layoffs, but also I think that it is time for us to have a little bit of empathy for leadership within our community of how it feels and how it impacts you as a human being to be the uh, messenger. And then we also have to onboard new employees while remote and hybrid. And I have seen this stretch organizations in ways they've never experienced before. It's really highlighted for a lot of leaders uh, here in the region, how much they depended on the osmosis of everybody working together and the sharing of information. And how do we do that now that we spend just physically more time apart from each other? So the red flags of burnout, I'm not going to focus on the individual symptoms of uh, stress, burnout, um, mental health challenges in leaders. There, you can read the list here, and I'm sure they're all things that you've probably heard before. What I do want to focus on is the quote here. When you are overwhelmed and stressed and with stress and confusion, it is hard to feel empathy for others. You're too busy trying to figure out your own issues. When your mental health is compromised, so is your emotional intelligence. Essentially, you're cut off from the synchronizing mechanism between you and your team, rendering your leadership unavailable. And that's something that's an emotional intelligence piece that all of us as leaders need to reflect through, not just how our mental health impacts us and those who are in our personal lives, but also to recognize that when your mental health isn't well, you're likely not leading. Your leadership is unavailable. Your empathy is unavailable. I can tell you because I'm the one who supports people like yourselves to work through challenges like these. 
that how your staff ex experience this is that you are focused on the task and you forget about the person. That means we're focused on our to-do list and our checklist. We need to get it done, get it done, get it done, send out the memo, all of those things. And we're forgetting about the person that's in front of us. We're forgetting about the empathy and we're forgetting to lead. What this means is for a lot of us, we become very over di uh, directive. We become overly blunt. We forget about our pleases and our thank yous and the basic human courtesies because we're so focused on just getting the work done. And this can create conflict and resentment on the team that you're leading. The team will also feel as though you have sort of abdicated your leadership role and your um, investment into them and that you're just sort of leaning into the tasks and um, getting the to-dos off of the list, which is not going to allow you to create a, a team that's gelling well together, working well together and coming to you when they need solutions. They're going to work around you and it's going to create a lot of problems. So, the reason I'm pointing that out for you is I want you to know and have it in the back, a little um, voice in the back of your head that when your mental health isn't well, when you are feeling stressed, it's important for you to be mindful that people are probably receiving you as overly direct, overly blunt, and that you're forgetting about the person in front of you and leaning too much and focusing on the task. The reason that that's helpful for you to know is as leaders, we can't always step away from our positions on days when we feel maybe our mental health is compromised. It is on those days that you're going to have to be extra intentional and sort of pull from that energy bank, making sure that you're using your pleases and thank yous, making sure that you're saying good morning and with all sincerity, stopping, pausing and listening to the response, not just rushing on to your next meeting. It's in those times that you will need to be a little bit extra on the courtesy to ensure, ensure that your team doesn't feel like your stress also becomes theirs, that you managing your stress well sets the tone for the entire team to be able to manage stress at work. So how do we lead through our mental health challenges? You thoughtfully and skillfully recognize and embrace the emotions and reactions to trauma that might surface. A compassionate leader must allow them to be felt. Burying your emotions and focusing on the tasks that you have at work is not benefiting um, you or anyone around you. And you likely believe that the, the symptoms and the impacts of, of that are hidden, and they're likely not. They're just not being addressed with you because of the power differential between your team and yourself. So here are some things that I would like you to focus on specifically in a leadership position in order to uh, strengthen your mental health and to allow you to better access uh, wellness strategies in the times when you're feeling not so well, because it does happen to all of us, let alone going through unprecedented times like the past two years. So I would like you to demand a positive culture for everyone by recognizing the way that you establish a positive wellness culture within your company or your organization is by putting your own oxygen mask on first. People will not listen to your words. People will follow your behaviors and they are watching your behavior. So with that, I recommend that you understand that the uh, employee assistance program that's available at the majority of your workplaces and personal days are for you too. That is not a resource that is for other people or a way that you keep your, your team revitalized so that they can work. It's also a resource that is in place for you. And by taking advantage of it and implementing it into your life in a way that keeps you well, your behaviors will encourage others to do the same. I would like you to think about where is your safe space? The one thing I can definitely tell you um, within my leadership role and something I've had to recognize in my career is I cannot fight a battle on both ends of my life. Um, work can be a little bit of a war zone, especially when na uh, navigating some of the impacts of the pandemic. That means when we get off work, our homes need to be a safe space where we feel at peace. They need to be a place that is welcoming to us resting and uh, refilling our bucket of resilience. I also, one thing that I've really had trouble with as a leader, and I, I know other leaders do too, so I want to call it out, is recognizing and appreciating that rest is productive and resilience is not infinite. 
Just because you say you are a resilient person does not mean it will be so in the long term, unless you accept the fact that a part of what contributes to your resilience and what makes you a, a real uh, fire at work is the fact that you prioritize rest and you understand that when resting in your off time is productive time. It is really important that leaders work at a reasonable pace. This is a conversation I've had to have uh, with many leaders over the past uh, two years, and it's a conversation I've had to have with myself too. The very nature of an emergency is that it is a one-off. Living in a state of emergency for two solid years is exhausting for everyone, but the only way we're going to get through it is if we work at a reasonable pace. Going into hyper overdrive for extended periods of time will put you off work. And yes, it means you too as the leader. It is really important that you work at a reasonable pace and that you maintain that reasonable pace and that you accept that that reasonable pace is productive and is you showing up and is you giving your 100% so that you can show up every day and give your 100%. When we give our 200% every day, we can, <laughs> it does put us on work. What you're hearing right now is my coworker, Olive. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, I am Lynn Charlton. <laughs> you will see that I post regularly about the shenanigans of my coworker. And you can hear right now that she's not being overly respectful of the fact that I'm giving this presentation. So I hope that you'll give me a little bit of grace and empathy in return. Um, for my wonderful Lab King Corso puppy coworker. Um, working at a reasonable pace. Nutrition, coffee is not food. It is really important that we are eating at irregular intervals throughout our day. I understand that that looks different for different people, but I can tell you when you're hangry, everyone notices it's not just you. Um, you it's not just you being a little bit edgy. Everyone around you is going to be on edge. It's really important that our, we're fueling our bodies at regular intervals so that we can show up as our best selves when leading other people through crisis. Social life. We need to have social lives that are completely unrelated to our jobs. One thing that many leaders um, uh, succumb to, and, and I've seen it even during um, the pandemic, is that we prioritize our social lives for things that will also um, add or bring benefit to our career. So please do understand that sitting on boards is fun and it is awesome. And I will always champion people to contribute to their communities by sitting on boards, but that is not a social life. It is very important that you have people around you that you engage with who you don't talk about work with. You just enjoy each other and they appreciate you for who you are as a person completely unrelated and outside of your career. That is how you fill your resilience bucket. It is important that we get moving. Uh, we were just talking about this uh, with uh, Jim Moss in the background that we need to leave our work on time and we need to take the damn wellness walk. I am the champion of the wellness walk and I struggle to prioritize it as well. There's always something else that seems more important, a deliverable I need to get out, a policy I need to write, a meeting I need to have. But in reality, I don't have the resilience necessary to keep up with those types of things on a regular basis if I'm not being intentional about the wellness walk. So I know we all facetiously slough it off like it's not really a priority, or we encourage our staff throughout the day to sort of um, go for a walk together as a part of their lunch break. But do understand that it is just as paramountly important that you are taking your mental health walks, or you are going to kickboxing, or you're going to the gym, or whatever physical pursuit it is that you enjoy, and you're doing that for 20 minutes to half an hour a day. It doesn't have to be a big sweat fest in order to benefit your mental health. It really is getting outside and being around grass and trees and fresh air and birds that is going to really help to fill your tank. And I would encourage you to be consistent with it. You will absolutely notice a difference. We also need to allow us to uh, understand that empathy is a two-way street. If you as a leader are not experiencing empathy within the workplace, it's likely it's because you are not giving empathy within the workplace. Uh, as leaders with empathy, we do tend to get what we give. So if you find that your staff are not being um, very understanding of you and some of the ways that COVID, uh, COVID, COVID has impacted you as a leader, then I would encourage you to reflect upon if your mental health is getting in the way of you being able to show empathy for your staff. 
because me refusing to show you empathy until you show me empathy isn't going to get it going. And so you as the leader need to really start the flow of empathy and really embed it in the culture. And it does start with you. Mindfulness, what works for you? For some people, it's yoga. For some people, it's meditation. For some people, it's painting. For some people, it's reading um, really disgusting nonfiction books where you don't learn anything. It can be different things for different people. I would really encourage you to work 20 minutes of mindfulness into your day in whatever pursuit it is that is of interest to you and understand that that is what's going to help you be in laser focus when you are in crisis. It is really funny how taking time away to invest in things that we often slough off or deprioritize as not being productive are actually the, the fuel that we need to be the most productive when our heat is turned up the highest. Delegate, your team is capable. I promise you they are. And I see this more prevalent in small business than I do in um, medium to large business. So if I have small business owners in the room, I am specifically talking to you. Your team is capable. They can take it on. If they're not capable, then connect with me and I'll help you work on your hiring strategy. But I guarantee you are currently carrying the stress of things that your team is capable of taking on for you. And it's time for you to trust them in order to help you with your mental health and in order for them to feel like you trust and want to invest in them. And then get it on the table. Don't pretend that everything is okay. It's not, and everybody knows, COVID has negatively impacted everyone, but in very different ways. Just because you didn't get COVID does not mean the pandemic didn't negatively impact you. Um, just because you weren't laid off doesn't mean the pandemic didn't negatively impact you. The, the, the pandemic negatively impacted everybody in various ways, and it's okay that we call that out. We don't have to pretend. You don't have to wear a mask every day as though everything is fine. Um, for a lot of us who are female in leadership, the school's open and closing, open and closing, kids in the house, kids out of the house, <laughs> us in the office, us, us out of the office. We all tried to really have this space of, I'm wearing this well and I can lead through this. It's okay to allow people to see you as a human being. Sometimes that's the permission other people need in order for them to feel like it's okay for them to be a human being at work. And when we're all human beings that work together, we all feel seen, we all feel heard, we all feel safe, we end up productive. And that's really where we wanna see our team. Be vulnerable with your team, it will pay off in spades. The other thing I wanna encourage you to focus on when you're getting it all out on the table and you're calling out um, perhaps things that didn't go well during the pandemic, it's time for us to reflect upon those things and create stronger systems. I would really like you to focus on solutions and not blame. And I would like you to declare that intention with your team at all times. There are hiccups that happened within every single business represented in this meeting today that happen that are nobody's fault. They're the result of, of extreme shifts and very quick unpredicted change within the business climate that we were all required to respond to ad hoc. Not all of those decisions were gonna land. Not all of the processes we had in place prior to the pandemic held up to working remotely, for example. So do understand that when you're calling those things out and you're asking your teams for feedback about those types of things, it's really important for you to declare to them that your intention is that you're looking to create solutions and strengthen the business. Your intention is never blame. Many of the challenges that we navigated over the pandemic times are just quite simply nobody's fault, but they're changes in the business climate that we need to respond to. I would also, oh, empathy is a two-way street. I have that on there twice. <laughs> and then again, pay attention to how you impact others. One of the greatest um, strengths you have as a leader is, is developing your emotional intelligence. You can lead through a lot of personal challenges if you're continuously focusing on how you're impacting others. And I guarantee the times when you have the least amount of energy to do it is the times when you need to be doing it the most. And so a really good indicator of your mental health not being strong or, or maybe needing to take a step back to think about um, how you better build your resilience and how you can better prioritize your time to fill uh, your bucket is when you don't really care how people are receiving you. That's a really good indication it's time to step back. You're low on empathy and you're probably not leading your team. You're being directive and you're managing.
So let's talk a little bit, um, just as I wrap up my last 10 minutes here, I wanted to talk a little bit about why do we care about this stuff? Um, for a lot of people, it is the, the warm and the fuzzy. We don't necessarily have time for that. Um, we need quantifiable or direct budget directly impacting reasons uh, to implement these types of strategies. For some of you, uh, you need me to provide you a business case for you to take care of yourself as a leader, and I'm happy to do that. One thing that has been really um, thrilling for me in my career in human resources is how there's always a business case for doing the right thing. And so here are some reasons why you as a leader need to take care of your mental health, why you need to set the tone for the culture by putting your own oxygen mask on first. So I chose this little graphic here because here's where the heart meets the smart. A lot of uh, the past two slides, I talked a lot about those heart things, those uh, the warm and fuzzies, and sometimes that doesn't land for people. The reality in business is for our businesses to be productive, for them to grow and for them to flourish is we have to have an excellent balance between the heart and the smart. So here are some smart reasons why you should take care of your mental health as a leader. Retention, the great resignation and recruitment challenges. Um, it's really important that you are setting the tone for positive mental health through your own behaviors in order to retain your staff. Through the great uh, resignation and recruitment challenges that I know uh, all businesses are experiencing uh, currently within the region, your best bet to battle that is to keep the people you have. And the best way for you to keep the people you have is for you to be a really strong leader during these times. And the way you do that is back to ensuring that you have positive mental health, ensuring that you're leading from a place of empathy, kindness, and emotional intelligence so that your team is following you. You aren't leading if nobody is following. Um, the other reality is that STD and LTD claims stress leaves have skyrocketed, and I'm sure many of you are nodding your heads um, right now when I say that. We have seen the use of uh, time away from work for the purposes of mental health, uh, time, uh, time loss, in unprecedented ways over the past two years. Some of that I can tell you confidently as a human resources professional is due to leadership not adequately managing their own mental health and, and how that compounds stress for their employees. The brand, employees, investors, customer, vendors, regulators, and other stakeholders will have the perception that your company is well managed by people who care, which is extremely important in today's day and times. Um, the great resignation has not just impacted employees and what they're looking for the, in the employment experience. It's also, I, I can tell, uh, impacting with clients and with vendors. They want to work with people who are also taking care of their employees, and they want to work with leaders who are also maintaining their own mental health. Um, creating collaborations with organizations that really invest in the mental health and wellness of their uh, staff and their leaders creates productive business relationships. And Again, it's just another business case for doing the right thing. Positive relationships are required for crisis, but positive relationships are not built in crisis. That's one thing that really hit home in 2020 for a lot of companies and a lot of organizations. They realized that their relationships with their employees were strained by how willing their employees were to help them respond to pandemic times. So do understand that in order for us to respond well to crisis, we require extreme loyalty from our employees. And that relationship and that loyalty is not built in crisis. It's not built in challenging times. You need to build that uh, prior to needing to hit go. And the reason I bring that up now is we're in a little bit of a lull time. We're in a time where we seem to be able to take a little bit of a deep breath. So in order to relieve your, stre your stress for the next time we need to hit go, because as leaders, we face crisis on an ongoing basis, I would really recommend that you take this time to invest in your relationships with your team. That is what's going to help you uh, lead through change with a lot less hiccups when we face it later. Um, increase productivity and overtime when needed. Um, our teams aren't really able to show up for us when they're completely burnt out and their mental health isn't well. When all of a sudden the supply chain frees up and we get those parts in and we need staff to show up and to be working overtime, they're, sometimes they're just simply not able to do so. Understand that that impacts you the exact same way as a leader. When your resilience is low and your mental health is challenging, you aren't able to show up for your company, your business, or your organization when they really need you. 
one reason we need to really proactively manage our mental health as leaders is so that we're ready when we're called upon. And so I would encourage you to understand that right now, again, when we're, we're looking towards the summer months, the sun is shining, we're going to be able to get outside to be more um, um, physically active and all of those things. I'd like you to take the opportunity to invest in your relationships with your employees in a positive way to ensure that you know that you have the emotional bank account with them, that when we're hitting change or challenge in future, you won't be as stressed. So with that said, my name is Lynn Charlton. I drive positive business results by providing human resources, leadership, and solutions to kind employers. I help employers Im implement kind strategies and empathy into their approach to human resources in order to see that quantifiable change on the bottom line. And I can help to do, uh, you to do that too. You can find me online. I am, I am Lynn Charlton or, um, on social media, and I am lynncharlton.com online. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jim Moss. I'm so excited for you all to hear from Jim Moss today. I've had the fortunate opportunity of having Jim Moss speak at a Disrupt um, HR uh, KW event just before the pandemic happened. And he is a fantastic speaker. So you're in for a lot of amazing information. And with that, I will pass the mic to him. Hello. Thank you, Lynn. That was fantastic. Wow. Um, there's so much advice that you just provided there that we align with in the work that we do at WorkWell. Um, you know, the, the idea of putting your own ma oxygen mask on first, the idea, uh, the, the identification of how am I showing up that might be a signal that me as a leader or a manager um, might not be at my own personal best. And, and I love the, the, distinguishing between when we're managing and when we're leading, right? When are we administrating a process that we know and understand, which is management or administration? And when are we leading, which is trying to get people to go somewhere that they, <laughs> that they may or may not want to go, but where we need them to go. And it's an entirely different set of skills. And it really does require our emotional uh, capacity to be high, our presence of mind, um, and, and being able to still feel like we're aligned with the big picture. Whenever we're under individual pressure, you know, we start to become more and more myopic. You know, we get more and more lost in the moment and our thoughts go from big thoughts to small and, and repetitive thoughts. And that usually means that we've been hijacked a little bit and that our empathy might become unavailable to us. I'm going to share a little bit of data with you. So uh, I'm the executive director of WorkWell at the YMCA, and we help organizations to understand and then improve the well-being of their of themselves and their and their staff. And the reason that we focus on that is that uh, it's time that we all start to understand that well-being, health, is a resource, right? Um, when we're lacking a certain amount of that health or well-being, or when the volatility of that well-being starts to increase significantly, um, we become less available. And so uh, when, if I were your employee, when you hired me, you hired me for a certain set of skills that I would bring to bear to help you accomplish your organizational goals. Um, and, you know, under a normal period of time, when I'm healthy, you should reasonably expect to, to experience the value of those skills. But if my individual well-being starts to go down and it stays down, right? Nobody's well-being or their health is, is completely static, right? It's always moving around. But if that volatility goes up, or if, if I actually move below critical thresholds, I'm physically incapable of doing what I used to do when I was at a higher level of health, when that health was steady. And so you may notice that, uh, you know, if very many people in your organization, their well-being is starting to be pressured, that it feels like you just can't get done what you used to get done. And that's because you literally don't have the same number of resources. You know, um, Lynn commented on the supply chain backups, right? And those are physical resources, the ingredients that you might use to make your products or the inventory that you use to sell um, to your customers. And you know, it's, it's very obvious when we're short on those things, we can't produce the same amount. We can't sell the same amount. We can't provide the same amount of service. Well, that 
individual well-being is very similar in terms of being a resource. And when there's not enough, it's no, it's no different than when the supply chain is backed up and you don't have the, the physical ingredients to make your products and your services. I'm just going to quickly share a little bit of data. So one of the things that's really important at work, well, the way that we differentiate ourselves is that we really like to understand how people are doing and where people are at. Um, so that we can think about, you know, what are the most important next actions to take. So here is some data um, collected from our community. About 80% of the respondents were from uh, southwestern Ontario or, or western Ontario. And we had data on people's self-reported well-being prior to the pandemic. And then we've been able to measure it three times. We're just in the middle of a fourth measure right now. But what you'll see is that you know, prior to the pandemic, about half, 52 to 53 percent of people in the two years prior reported themselves as healthy, averagely healthy, right? And only about a quarter of people, so 24 and 22 percent, reported themselves as unhealthy. So that's that's regardless of the workplace construct. That's just their general health and well-being. That means that one out of four people were showing up to the workplace at any given time without the, um, the amount of health that they would like to have to be able to participate actively in their career. But at, at the two out of four, you know, and, and generally speaking, adequate scores allow people to still show up and, and function uh, at least partially, right? Uh, but two out of four people were showing up optimally healthy, as healthy as they would like to be. And so what we say when we say healthy is that there isn't anything that you must do to maintain or improve your health when you're in that healthy state. When you're adequate, there are things that you might do to improve your health. When you're unhealthy, there are things that you must do, that you must get in order to improve your health. When we look at the pandemic, we go to August 2020. So this is just a few months after the pandemic. That number dropped by more than half. So now we're looking at you know one in four or almost one in five people uh, reporting themselves as being healthy. And the number of people reporting themselves as unhealthy has more than doubled. And that means that half of the workforce started to show up um, significantly less healthy than they were just a few months prior. We probably felt that. But um, another thing that Lynn commented on a little bit was the chronic nature of the pandemic, right? But in those first few months, we were in a triage mentality. It was a crisis. And we have a tendency, like what part of what makes humans really resilient is that we're really capable of reacting to very difficult challenges for a period of time, running on adrenaline, for example. But after a few months, you know, it switches from being a hyper or acute mode into a chronic state. And what we've actually seen in the data is that that unhealthiness or that change in our health has been chronic. So while the pandemic kind of labored on, you know, I'd love to say that it's post pandemic times, but you know, we're kind of referring to this as late pandemic, uh, but we haven't seen much of a rebound yet in people's health and well being. So what that means is that uh, people are still showing up significantly less healthy than they would like to be. And, and less healthy than you might like them to be or need them to be in order to accomplish your goals. And you know, if, if that were to happen for a short period of time, most organizations can kind of handle that blip and, and steer their way through those choppy waters. But when it starts to become chronic like this, you may find that the productivity overall is becoming predictably lower and that you may require more people to get the same amount of work done, to accomplish the same goals as you were able to accomplish prior to the pandemic. Uh, really importantly, when we talk about this data is that when we, when we looked at different groups of people, so people who remained working physically on the front line versus people who, you know, who moved and, and began working from home or maybe went back and forth, or people who moved to working remote and stayed remote, um, all of those people, the groups, the averages of the health looked about the same, but the reasons why they were reporting feeling less healthy than they'd like to be were significantly um, different. And so understanding that the, the population is feeling similarly, but for different reasons, means that there's no one size fits all here to support people's well-being. We also know that uh, during the pandemic, people's uh, concept of their health changed from being very physically 
focused or oriented to really starting to consider their social, emotional, and psychological well-being. And so, you know, Lynn, Lynn touched on this a, a bit as well. You know, there, our physical health allows us to show up physically, you know, um, burn the calories that we need to burn, be physically present, lift the same amount of weight potentially, et cetera, et cetera. But our psychological and our social emotional health really speaks to how do we relate with other people. And if I think about the, you know, the who's probably in the audience today, you might, you might have retail, you might have a service business, you might have a manufacturing business, right? But almost nobody has a business where human to human interaction isn't critically important. And so what we've seen is this concept of burnout on the rise. Uh, burnout in a nutshell is the inability to manage the stress of work in a continuous way or in a satisfactory way. And so, you know, we can blip and have a little period of time, a couple of weeks where, you know, stress gets the better of us and we're having a hard time keeping up with the stress of work. But the longer that that goes on, the, the more likely that we are to, um, to experience this chronic burnout. So when we ask people in the most recent survey, how many of people had experienced some often or extremely often they're experiencing burnout. And you can see about a third of people sometimes and then another 23 and 14% very, very often. And when we looked at the mental health scores of those people um, based on how they were reporting their experience of burnout, the average mental health score, so self-reported score on a scale of one to 100 of people who never experienced burnout is 79. That's fantastic. That's across the threshold of healthy. The people who are experiencing burnout rarely or sometimes 70 and 63. So now we're into the top end of adequate and the, and the bottom end of adequate, right? So we're getting into the danger zone and we're not as healthy as we'd like to be. For the people who are reporting experiencing burnout often, their mental health score is 49. So this is about 15 points below the threshold of uh, 12 to 15 points below the threshold of what would be considered adequate. So this means that very much it, this is impacting my ability to do my job in a consistent way, which means that I'm going to relate differently to people. You know, my behaviors are going to change. Uh, I'm more prone to making mistakes, et cetera. And then the people experiencing burnout extremely often, their mental health scores at 33. So this is really, really critical data because it tells us that it tells us that um, not only are people um, not as physically healthy or, or their health overall is not to the same at the same place that they would like it to be. But they're also starting to experience burnout more and more frequently. And when they experience those feelings of burnout, it's a really strong predictor that their mental health specifically is starting to, to suffer. Um, so what does it look like and what do we do, right? If we, if we uh, reflect a little bit on some of the things that Lynn said, um, the, the use of empathy, the monitoring of empathy, the mindfulness to be able to recognize how we're feeling or how other people are feeling. You know, um, she talked a lot about the, the need for emotional intelligence and it's super critical, uh, especially when things are different and require us to potentially act in different ways. Um, we need to be paying really close attention to our employees. Uh, we need to be looking for patterns in the way that they show up. And importantly, we're talking about mental health and not mental illness per se. Me mental illness requires a different set of supports, et cetera. Um, mental health is kind of on the top half of that scale. And we would love to uh, meet people and support people upstream, right? When their mental health is under pressure, but before the time that they might start to experience uh, clinical mental illness challenges where they're definitely going to need external mental health supports and mental illness supports from the, from the healthcare system. But by paying really close attention to people, we can start to see patterns. And um, the, the benefit of many of your businesses might be from staying physically in the workplace is that you can still see people or more people uh, with your own eyes. As people move to working from home in some industries, um, what we found was really good people managers um, started to struggle with identifying what the patterns were in their staff because they're used to seeing them physically with their own eyes. And everybody can kind of clean themselves up and look presentable on Zoom. I mean, I'm not even wearing pants right now and nobody even knows it. But if I had showed up to the office or the workplace without pants on, that would be an immediate red flag. 
So being able to pay attention to our employees' patterns can help us to see if they might be struggling a little bit. Uh, what are the things that we might look for? Emotional reactivity is a really, really important one. So uh, what we started to hear about a year into the pandemic was, you know, my rock star employee just had a meltdown, right? Certainly that rock star employee, the reason you call them a rock star is because they had a long pattern of behaving in a really positive, uh, functional way. And then suddenly, or, or what might seem like suddenly, their behavior changed significantly. And so they had a meltdown, right? What were the signs that we might have seen prior to that meltdown, right? And, and maybe because they've had such a long history of being healthy and productive, you know, our attention is somewhere else, potentially paying attention to the challenges and the problems or different employees who don't have that same track record. And so we weren't even really looking at that employee quite as closely. So it caught us off guard when they had, you know, quote unquote, a meltdown. But what we can look for are things like emotional reactivity. So are people having a slightly more emotional or emotionally charged reactions to things that they haven't previously, you know, everybody moderates uh, interactions in different ways, but if we know our employees well, we can identify those patterns and what we're looking for is, is really just a significant change in that pattern. And then what do we do, right? So ideally, you know, again, on that concept of if we, if we can interact sooner, if we can intervene and support sooner, we can give them different things to support them prior to the point of where we get to some kind of a critical health uh, challenge or failure that might require them to take time off work, et cetera. And so the, the real answer is that we have to be a good human. We have to go towards them. We have to offer them support. We have to ask questions. Um, you know, this week, we, there's a lot of talk about empathy. And empathy helps us to imagine how somebody else might be feeling. That imaginatory experience is never going to be perfect, right? Um, when somebody's very different than we are, our imagination of how they might be feeling might be inadequate. And so if we can't really imagine how somebody else might be feeling, then we have to ask. And, and so Lynn also commented, and we know this to be true, that you needed to have healthy workplace culture before the pandemic, really, to, to lean on the benefits of it during the pandemic. And so hopefully you've got trust in your relationships and they, they believe that you care about them. And so when you ask, how are you feeling? And is there anything I can do for you? Um, that they meet that in a healthy, positive way. And they're willing to open up to you or to another leader in your organization. But really uh, it comes down to asking, and then trying to figure out what it is that you might be able to do to, to provide support to them. And we've, we've um, noticed that the number one kind of predictors of organizations who are able to stay healthy during the pandemic is flexibility and adaptability. So there were things that we weren't willing to do or we couldn't do prior to the pandemic for any number of reasons. Uh, and then we needed to do. They weren't just nice to haves anymore, they became must haves. And the organizations who were willing to reconsider what they might be able to do, right? You might be able to work from home for a couple of weeks. Uh, I might be able to shorten your shifts. Um, depending on where they work in the organization, can I move them somewhere further away from the front line? So if you're in a customer facing organization, can I move you into a stock room or a storeroom? Can I move you into an office where you're protected a bit more from the stress, but also where your uh, emotional reactivity is less likely to have a negative effect on a customer or a peer-to-peer -peer employee. And so, you know, many of you built a lot of processes in your business that have led you to be successful. And, uh, and the pandemic has asked you to rethink those processes. It's almost required you to do that. And empathizing with how you're probably feeling, you know, uh, as leaders, it's been a lot of learning for a couple of years. And so continuing to ask us to do more and different is what's wearing us down, which is why Lynn's discussion about your mental health was so important, right? And the answer here is that we've got to keep doing it. And so another thing that Lynn said that was really important was you need to start to trust the people around you. You need to empower other leaders and other managers to, to be able to support you because this isn't going away. This is, we're into this chronic state now. 
and the flexibility and the adaptability that you've had to provide in order to support your employees, uh, you have to continue to provide. And people are going to expect that and they're going to need it. And if they're not going to get it, they're thinking about leaving and going somewhere else. Uh, 60% of employees who were considering leaving their job in the next six months um, stated that their personal well-being was the number one reason for, for looking for a job elsewhere. And so if you can't look for ways and find ways, if you can't or you're not willing or able to be flexible and provide that adaptability to support people in the ways that they might need, right, in any number of ways, again, no silver bullet, um, not completely customized, but, uh, but highly customized to people's individual needs. And then you might expect for them to go and look for another place to work uh, where they will find that. And as those best employers kind of suck the most, the healthiest and the best employees out of the pool of available talent, right? You're going to lose some of your best. Other people are going to attract those best and you're going to be left with a, a less ideal talent pool in order to hire in from it. So it's a double-edged sword. So um, in a nutshell, you know, the thing that we need to do is we need to realize and understand that even though we might be starting to, you know, think that what we see is, is uh, perfectly accurate and people look normal again, the data that we have says that only half as many people are as healthy as they'd like to be as prior to the pandemic. And so we should assume two out of four of our employees or five out of 10 of our employees are not as healthy as they'd like to be. That means we need to pay attention to those, to our employees and try to understand who it is that might be struggling. And when we see people's behavioral patterns changing, their emotional reactions starting to get a little spicier or a little, uh, they have a little bit of a hair pin trigger, then we move towards them and we ask, how are they doing? And what is it that I could do to support you? Um, this is the work that we do all day, every day in all sorts of organizations and all sorts of types of work. And if there's anything that we can do to support you or your organization, please reach out to us. Uh, it's YMCA workwell.ca. Um, you can find us on all the social media. My Twitter handle is the smile CEO um, uh, on, on Twitter, pardon me, and on Instagram and on Facebook. Please find a way to reach out. And I think we're going to switch it over here and try to answer some questions that you might have. So thank you for taking the time out of your day to show up. This is a super important topic. I know that the, the periods of time that we both had were a little uh, short, so we we're both trying to jam a lot in there. But hopefully you were able to take away one or two pearls of wisdom from Lynn and myself, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Jim. That was fantastic. And you as well, Lynn, that, when both presentations were fantastic today. And I sincerely appreciate you uh, taking the time um, to present um, mental during Mental Health Awareness Week. <laughs> um, so yes, now we can take some questions. We have a few minutes if anybody has any. But perhaps in the meantime, um, could you perhaps share um, with the attendees maybe your, what you hope, your biggest takeaway, what you want, want to share with them today? Pay close attention. Pay close attention to people. And at, uh, to piggyback on Lynn's point, you have to pay attention to yourself as well, right? And notice if you're able to be attentive or not, that's obviously a red flag, but um, pay close attention to your people uh, and less attention necessarily on the other parts of your business that you used to. And trust that if you take really good care of your people uh, and do a good job of that, they will take care of your business. So pay really close attention to and support your people as best as you can. I would like leaders to leave with, just to jump off what Jim just said, that in, in order to be able to do that, they must first do it for themselves. So if you would like to have a, an, a business, an organization or a company that is uh, managing and leading employees uh, towards maintaining positive mental health, you must be someone who exhibits those behaviors in a, in a genuine and authentic way your staff will listen to your behaviors. They will follow your behaviors. They will not follow your words. Fantastic. 
I'm not seeing any other questions come through, um, but I think both of them uh, made it clear in their presentations that uh, you can reach out to them on social media or um, whatever the case may be. Um, but again, I want to take some time to uh, thank you both for presentation today. And thank you so much for uh, all of the attendees for joining us today to discuss the importance of mental health in the workplace. I also, once again, want to thank the sponsors today um, for their continued support of the Chamber. Events like this would not be possible without you, so thank you. Be sure to check out the Chamber's website for fantastic upcoming events you don't want to miss, um, including this Thursday, we have a business growth series sponsored by Cowan Insurance Group. A brutal, a brutal prioritization in times of turbulence. Again, Thursday, May 5th at 11 to noon. We also have business after hours coming up at the venue here on Hessler Road on Monday, May 10th from 5 to 6.30. And a week from today, um, we're going to discuss um, diversifying to include top talent from refugee sources and it's an online event happening Tuesday, May 11th from 11 to noon. Once again, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.